The Apostle Paul was arrested in Jerusalem. The mob accused him of teaching things contrary to the Jewish law and way of life and of bringing Gentiles into the temple. He languished in Caesarea for two years while corrupt politicians ignored his case. He finally appealed to Rome, and after a harrowing voyage, he arrived in the imperial capital under house arrest. He waited another two years for his trial before Caesar. And during this time, he wrote Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon, letters commonly called the prison epistles, where he was confident he would be released and able to travel once again. It seems that Paul's optimism was well-founded and that he regained his freedom. During this time, he went to Crete with Titus and maybe to Asia Minor and then to Greece and Macedonia. He wrote 1 Timothy and Titus, instructing his protégés on how best to conduct themselves in Ephesus and Crete, respectively, as they did the work of the Lord. Eventually, however, Paul was arrested again and back in Rome, according to 2 Timothy 1, 16 and 17. Timothy was still in Ephesus, but the church situation which concerned Paul in 1 Timothy had evidently deteriorated. So Paul wrote Timothy a second letter urging him to quickly travel to Rome and visit him. In 1 Timothy, Paul's concern for the spiritual health of the Ephesian congregation focused on the presence of false doctrine and unfit church leaders. Well, the influence of those individuals had grown to the point where Paul bemoaned, you know that everyone in the province of Asia has deserted me, 2 Timothy 1.15. Now, this statement is reflective of the overall mood of 2 Timothy. In the four prison epistles, Paul is optimistic and upbeat about his chains for Christ, accomplishing amazing things in Rome. He was so certain of his impending release that he was making travel plans. Not so in 2 Timothy. This was his assessment of his predicament. For I'm already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight, I've finished the race, I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. 2 Timothy 4, 6-8. Paul believed his departure was near. So he told Timothy, do your best to come to me quickly, chapter 4, verse 9. While 1 Timothy primarily addresses the issues at the Ephesian congregation, 2 Timothy is a deeply personal letter focused on reminding Timothy of what the apostle had taught him. He tells Timothy to remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, descended from David, chapter 2, verse 8, to keep reminding God's people of what he had learned in chapter 2, verse 14, and to flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart, chapter 2, verse 22. In chapter 3, he warns of terrible times on the horizon, but that in spite of all that Paul had suffered, the Lord was ever with him, and indeed is with all those who are persecuted for Christ's sake. So what is Timothy to do in the face of false brethren, apostasy, persecution, and suffering? In the presence of God, and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. And even when people turn their ears away from the truth, Keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Discharge all the duties of your ministry. 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 5. James E. Smith offers a fascinating proposal about 2 Timothy. In his book, Formation of the Bible, Smith discusses what he calls the Rome Summit. Now, according to 2 Timothy, Luke was with Paul in Rome, and the apostle told Timothy to hurry to join them and to bring along John Mark. Then he wrote, When you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus in Troas and my scrolls, especially the parchments, 
2 Timothy 4.13. Now, most scholars assume that Paul requested his cloak because winter was approaching. But Smith points out that surely Luke could have provided him with some cold weather gear. Instead of cloak, Smith says the word can refer to a receptacle of books, especially a parchment cover for papyrus rolls. It may have been that Paul was just urging Timothy to join him quickly simply because they were dear to each other and Paul wanted to see him before his execution. But Smith says something else may be going on here. He proposes that Paul's goal is to gather together into one collection all of the New Testament documents which had thus far been written. Between Luke and Timothy, they would have had access, of course, to copies of Luke's gospel account and the book of Acts, as well as all of Paul's letters, which had gone out across Asia Minor, Macedonia, Achaia, and Rome. By bringing John Mark with him, Paul assured they would have a copy of Mark's gospel account and maybe even 1 Peter if it had already been written. Assuming John's writings were not yet completed, this would leave only Matthew and James. But those two documents were among the oldest in the New Testament and were probably so well circulated by this time that Paul's crew had copies. Thus, Paul essentially said, Come quickly, Timothy, for there is work to be done before my departure. Remember all that I taught you and uh, entrust it to other faithful men. Continue to do the work. Preach the word and let's gather all the Christian scriptures so they can be easily shared. Paul was passing the baton to the next generation. He spent decades preparing these men while he traveled and wrote. He has taught them everything he learned from the Hebrew scriptures and the Holy Spirit, and now it was time to go to be with the Lord. 2 Timothy 4.18 says, The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. What an amazing thought that these men gathered in Rome in the face of such darkness, knowing that their beloved and faithful teacher was about to die. From his prison cell, he guided them one last time as they work together to safeguard the future of the church. Oh, that we would do likewise. Prioritizing the training of young Christians and endeavoring to uplift the next generation that they might go and do likewise.